Hi everybody, my name is Amandine Lemaire. I'm a PhD student at a university in Scotland called Herit Watt University, where I'm part of the mobile deaf team led by Dr Annalise Coosters. My presentation, well first of all I want to thank you for inviting me to come and present at this conference and my presentation will be about deaf refugees and their language. You can see on the slide there is a map of Kenya and in the northwest of the country there's a refugee camp called Kakuma. You can see next to the map of Kenya there's an illustration of Kakuma refugee camp. You can see the extent of it, it's very large, divided into four units, Kakuma 1, 2, 3 and 4. The first of which, Kakuma 1, was established in 1990 as a new refugee camp for the vicinity and the surrounding areas from countries like Sudan or Somalia or other countries in that area where there was war or political conflict which meant that it was impossible for people to live in those countries and they had to flee to become refugees in Kenya in the refugee camp. So I went to Kenya. I also visited Kakuma refugee camp where I stayed for four months. So I will talk about the approach that I took to my data collection. So you can see on this slide, I use participant observation. I'm an anthropologist myself, so it's more about meeting people, conversing with them, finding out how they live, what they do, what their jobs are and so forth. And when I first arrived at Kakuma, I had to find where the deaf people were in such a massive camp. So I found out that there were different hearing school, schools within the camp, some of which had deaf units within them. And I visited three such schools and met deaf people there, not just deaf children, but also deaf adults. And as I developed relationships with them, they invited me, for example, to visit their homes, which I did on several occasions. And also within the camp, there was further education, for example, cooking um, and sewing. And so I went and observed these settings as well. And as our relationships built up, it got to the point where I was able to ask the participants for their consent to interview them as part of the research. And I selected seven participants with varied backgrounds in terms of gender, be they man or woman, different age, and also different countries of origin, either from Sudan or from Somalia. Now, I was aware that my own positionality would influence the research as a white, non-African European woman working at a university, I was aware that that would influence my participants' perceptions and my research. So for example, when I went to meet the participants, many of them thought that I was from the UN, UNHCR. And they're responsible for the camp management, they deliver the food, the water, and protect the individuals living there. That's what they're responsible for. They're additionally responsible for refugees who wish to leave the camp and be re relocated to other countries like America, Canada, England and so forth. And these refugees have to register their interests on a list and eventually they may be picked by the UN to be relocated. Now, not all of them can be relocated, so often they're waiting for a long time before they actually get to go. And my participants believed I was from the UN there to help them, to assist them with this relocation to another country. And I had to explain again and again that I was not from the UN. I wasn't there to help them in that regard. And so that's an example of how my positionality influenced their perceptions of me. And I had to repeatedly explain this, that I was there as a researcher. I was documenting their stories and that was it. Now on this next slide, you can see, as I said before, my topic was all about language. So first of all, I was interested in how and where refugees learned sign language. And of course, it happened at school. Many of the deaf refugees from the neighbouring countries had the languages from their own countries, either Somalia or Sudan, which they had learned before coming to the camp. 
and then moving to Kakuma, they started to receive education in sign language, perhaps for the first time for many of them. And also, once they had finished their primary education in the deaf units in the hearing schools, they, many of them went on to high school. Now, there was no high school in the refugee camp, so they would request, if they wanted to go to high school, to go to a Kenyan high school. And once approved, they would go to this Kenyan high school and be funded by the UN, and they would stay for four or five years receiving their education, and they would learn Kenyan sign language there. After the period of four or five years in the Kenyan high school, they would return to Kakuma refugee camp. So they had language learning from primary school, but also the influence of Kenyan sign language from their high school education. And also, on a regular basis, every day, they would mix with other deaf refugees in the camp. And so they would learn sign language from them, sign language that they'd learned at school, for example, or church. And so there was a whole mixture of languages that they would learn from contact with others. Now, I wanted to apply Bourdieu's theory to my research. And Bourdieu talked about the concepts of habitus, field and capital. I was particularly focusing on capital not just linguistic, but also cultural capital. So I was interested in how to apply his theory to my research. So to give you an example, deaf refugees who move to Kakuma refugee camp, as I said before, learn Kenyan sign language and different sign languages. And that expands their linguistic capital as a result of learning these languages and moving to the camp. So I want to show you a video of one of the interviews that I did with my participants and it's interesting what he said so I'll show you the video now. So you can see in the video, this participant, whose name is Adam, he's from the south of Sudan, and he moved from Sudan as a result of war and became a refugee in Kakuma when he was a small child. And I asked him how he had learned sign language. How did he know how to sign? And he told me that a long time ago, when he had left Sudan and moved to Kakuma, he hadn't known any sign language, but at that time, an American teacher had come to the camp to teach American sign language, and that is how he'd learned it. Also, he had gone to high school in Kenya and learned Kenyan sign language. So you can see, previously he'd learned ASL and then later Kenyan sign language, so he has influences from both languages. Also, Refugees learn sign language from school, yes, but also they learn sign language from meeting other deaf refugees and interacting with them. I'll show you an example of this in the next video. This other participant is a woman from Somalia and previously she had moved to a different refugee camp called Dadaab. That's also in Kenya and it's also huge, same as Kakuma. 
This is his sign name, Dadaab. So she had initially been located in Dadaab and then moved to Kakuma refugee camp. Growing up in Dadaab, she hadn't gone to school, but she knew there were football matches going on regularly. And the deaf refugees loved to play football there. So she would go and sit and watch them playing match after match. And also at the same time, she was observing the deaf players using sign language. And she learned sign language from watching them play football. Which means that refugees don't just acquire sign language from their school education, but also from their everyday social interactions as well. Not only was I interested in how the refugees learnt their language, but also how deaf refugees coped with interactions with hearing people within the camp. For example, staff from NGOs or Kenyans who were mingling with others within the camp. How do deaf people navigate this situation? For example, hospital appointments or wanting to meet a representative from the UN. How, how did they communicate? Was it through sign or through written notes? And I observed some examples that I'll explain to you now. You can see on the slide, there's the logo of the United Nations. Within the camp, the UN has various offices so that if refugees feel they've got a problem, an issue at home, or a family dispute that is a problem that they're not sure how to resolve, then they can go to one of these offices and meet a representative of the UN, describe their issue, and the UN staff member may help them uh, to resolve any problem they have. So I was invited to go to one of these meetings by a deaf refugee, and I went along. And deaf refugees um, use gesture, written notes to communicate, um, and they also use family members, for example, to go with them. It could be their parents or a brother or sister who will go with them to such an appointment. Because of course, within the family, they will use a different language, not necessarily English. Typically, it will be a tribal language from their home country. And the mouth patterns are quite different from English. So the youth, use of these mouth patterns can help communication. And then the family member will translate the information into English. So that can assist with communication as well. Now, another example. One deaf father of a child who was sick and in the hospital had to go to see a doctor there. And they were looking for a hearing person who had good gesture. And they waited until they found somebody who had good gesture, who by good fortune was also from the same tribe as that person. So the lip patterns were very similar to the language that they both understood, and they were able to understand each other well. Also, the deaf refugees can sometimes write English and communicate through that means. So there's a whole range of different ways that they use to assist communication. And of course, in Africa, there's a strong culture of gesture, as shown by Annelies Kuster's research. And in Africa, people are more used to using gesture, even hearing people. It's quite different from some other countries. So gesture can be used to aid communication. And some gestures used are the same for both hearing and deaf. For example, the number 10. So they can use gesture to aid communication. You can also see on this next slide that sometimes there are interpreters working. And these interpreters can come from Kenya, or perhaps um, they have been educated within the deaf unit and can sign, therefore they can function as an interpreter. Now, of course, interpreting is a different culture from just communication. They must maintain impartial boundaries, not be there to be biased towards helping the deaf person. Um, so there's a whole range of issues around interpreting in the camp. Now, you know, when the refugees first arrive at the camp for the very first time, they have to meet a representative of the United Nations who registers their name and details and assigns them the official status of being a refugee in the camp. So this is a mandatory interview when they first arrive. Now, I didn't see one of those interviews myself. So I can't describe it to you firsthand, but my participants described to me 
that when they had gone for their interview, there was an interpreter there working, but how the interpreter worked, I don't know. Now, as I said, the United Nations have staff representatives there to help resolve disputes. And I went to one of these meetings with one of my participants. And the deaf refugee would sign to me. I wrote down in English and passed the note to the staff representative from the UN. So they asked me to assist him in that way. That's another example of my positionality influencing the research process. Another area of interest in my study was language ideologies. And I could see that the refugees um, had these different languages, as I mentioned, Kenyan Sign Language, American Sign Language, but also Somalia and Sudan have their own sign languages too. And I was interested in how the deaf refugees viewed these different languages, what their ideologies were. And I could see that some of the, the sign languages were viewed as having more value than others. And when I asked about Somalian or Sudanese sign languages, I got the response typically that they were not sign languages. I think the deaf refugees' ideologies were that Sudanese and Somali sign language were not official proper languages like ASL or Kenyan sign language, which they viewed as having a higher status. So their ideologies were linked to the official status of Kenyan sign language and ASL, and they described their home sign languages as being village sign languages, village signing. This is their sign for village. And they viewed them as quite different from ASL or Kenyan Sign Language. There's one interesting example. One deaf refugee wanted to go and relocate to America. So I'd registered with the United Nations for the chance of relocating to the States and told me that it was very important that he knew ASL because he wanted to go and study in America. I'll show you the video. Now you can see in the video, that man is from the south of Sudan and he was explaining to me how he wanted to learn ASL. He wants to learn it because he wants to be relocated to the States. And he views ASL as a high status, important language that can possibly help him with that relocation process because he knows the language. So now I want to conclude my presentation. In terms of refugees' language use, you see that they can encounter barriers with communication with hearing people, but they have a range of strategies that they use to overcome these, such as gesture, writing notes, or using mouthings from their tribal languages. They also have linguistic capital and social capital, in Bordeauxian terms, linked to the number of different languages that they know, ASL, Kenyan Sign Languages, their tribal languages, which gives them quite an extensive linguistic repertoire which they can use to aid communication. And also, the deaf refugees have a network of people from their own home tribe that can help them navigate communication situations. They also are part of the deaf network within the camp. So this shows that their social and linguistic capital interact with each other. They also have a variety of views about the status and value of different languages. So Kenyan and ASL are viewed as being higher status compared to their home languages. I hope you found my presentation interesting and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you.